Uh, we're just sitting straight behind our oven, which is nice, I think, of in front of our oven. You're sitting, you're sitting in front of one of your roasters. That's great. So this is Clay Gordon from New York. And? Hello, this is Jan Willem from Heine and Verre from Rotterdam. Hi, this is Ewald, also from Heine and Verre. We are in our factory in Rotterdam, and sitting just in front of our roasting oven. Welcome. Sitting just in front of one of your roasters. <laughs> so that's in front of a drum roaster. Yeah. Um, and this is where we're starting today. Um, I wrote an article for The Chocolate Life which got um, posted onto LinkedIn. And as a result of uh, some of the comments, um, we started this discussion, number one, about um, roasting and how to roast. I mean, I started off with a notion of a very, very simple notion that there's a difference between what heavy roasting might be and light roasting might be. But what I really wanted to do was start a discussion about around the idea that there is um, an ideal roasting profile. And Abel, this is something that you and I discussed a great deal when you and I were um, in Amsterdam at Chocoa, and then when I visited um, your factory again, when I was in Rotterdam a couple of weeks later, um, and there's an article on the Chocolate Life, and this will be linked to in the descriptions and all that kind of stuff. Um, but what I wanna do is I want to um, talk a little bit more about um, your approach to roasting and um, your approach to blending and um, why you think that these kinds of things um, are uh, important tools in a chocolate maker's uh, tool toolkit for making chocolate. And the first place I'd like to start um, is when the two of you were, th you know, just starting and thinking about creating the company. Was this notion of blending, um, so different origins um, and different roasts and things like that, a part of what you wanted to do from the very beginning, or was it something that you came to after experimentation? <laughs> very, um, good, very good question. Good question. Uh, yeah. uh, blending origins was actually from the practically from the start one of the things we wanted to do because what we yeah. uh, let's, let's, the very first notion we had when we started the company was when we had a very bad quality milk bar somewhere on an Italian airport, and we both love milk chocolate. So our first guess was let's make the best milk chocolate in the world, craft milk chocolate. That was the one main ambition. I think we still have that ambition. Um, Secondly, uh, when we were thinking about making chocolate in the Netherlands, uh, we were we were just we, when we were discussing that um, uh, we both have, like the, let's say the, the Dutch traditional chocolate brands that don't exist anymore. So we are from an older generation, and the time there were some a lot of chocolate factories in the Netherlands. Uh, whereas nowadays we have a few small craft chocolate factories, but the big brands don't produce chocolate anymore. So we were we were just looking into to build upon the Dutch chocolate tradition. And from that uh, concept, we got the, the notion of the Dutch blend, which is a blend of, let's say, that has a flavor profile that reminds us of traditional Dutch chocolate. So the first idea also was to build, a, to make a blend of origins mm -hmm. uh, that reflects, and also the way of roasting uh, that reflects, let's say, the Dutch favorite flavor profile. And from that on, of course, we uh, we started, of course, experimenting with all kinds of uh, uh, roasting profiles to get the most out of the flavor. And soon we discovered that uh, yeah, there is no one uh, perfect roast for it because uh, when you start working with the beans, you discover all kinds of uh, interesting notes, and uh, that uh, got us the idea that well, we should experiment and do more. So it became more about blends of origins, but it also became a blend of uh, uh, roasting profiles just to get to extract the most flavor out of the beans and it is a disc it also depends on the type of bean some beans are, uh, are more suitable for using different profiles than others for example porcelana is a very fragrant and light bean we mainly use one roast profile for that uh, but the barley for example has uh, it's, it's the barley beans that we use are quite simple so they have let's say two basic elements which is some kind of sandalwood and there is a flavor of raisins or dried grapes or grapes. And uh, we found out that the higher we roast the bean, the more it moves to raisins and the sour wine type of flavors. And the lower we roast the bean, the fresher the, the grape flavor is. Um, uh, that's when we first actually started using different profiles. And so roasting different profiles deliberately and then mixing those two different roast yep. profiles yep. Uh, in order to be able to preserve both of those flavors. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And to make a more interesting and more complex uh, flavor with a, a longer mm -hmm. aftertaste, all that comes with it. And the, let's say the most Baroque 
bean that we have, the most wild bean, is the, is the, is the, is the Brazil uh, chocolate that we make. And we, there are so many different flavors to discover in that bean with using different roast profiles. And also the profiles are really very different. There's profiles that take a very long time on low temperatures. We have a profile which is uh, with a climbing temperature. We have a profile where we put in a high temperature in a short, short period. And each of these profiles is really rewarding uh, in bringing in different flavors. Yeah, from one single origin. From yeah. one single bean type. So, so when you first started making chocolate, I mean, many of many craft chocolate makers um, will look to Chocolate Alchemy and John Nancy. Mm -hmm. So yep. there they go. It's their first introduction to using small mach machinery, and he has a particular approach to roasting, right? Mm -hmm. And that particular approach to roasting, I think, is have been, has been very, very influential. Um, it's an experiential roast profile. Basically, you roast until it smells right, and then. I mean, mm -hmm. this is my simple, um, well, simple it is, explanation. It is, it is, I think it's a great start still. It's a great start. Yeah, yeah. And, and the smell is important. Also, when we try to figure out new roast profiles, there is a specific aroma that is released. And let's say, even if you have a profile of roasting in terms of up climbing temperature or lower temperatures, the precise parameters per origin mm -hmm. uh, can differ. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and we, we recognize certain sweet spots or certain touch points in the in the mm -hmm. time where we say, okay, this is a specific flavor, now we reach this point. And mm -hmm. when we're over roasting, we call this the peanut point, for example. And because if, <laughs> if you take a bean afterwards mm -hmm. and you simply grind it, it has the smell of, of burnt peanuts. Yeah. But, also, but then you're way too ahead in the process, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and Clay, you also have to mind, uh, our background is, of course, in, uh, in wine. And therefore, if you want to taste good wines, you expect a certain complexity and a long taste. And that was also uh, drove us to uh, to to make this eh? yeah. because you want uh, a similar experience in uh, in chocolate as in, in wine, and, and so yeah. maybe one uh, just kicking. Let's say uh, no, just uh, it's tri tricky to say this in the craft chocolate world. But for for us, most of the single origin are, are a bit more one dimensional than origin blends. And one way to make a single origin more complex is to mm -hmm. use either uh, a Solera style blending, which we discussed before, like different aging stages or mm -hmm. use a roast profile blending, because then you bring in more complexity to also to a single origin. And this is what we like in chocolate. Yeah. So we did talk about Solera style blending, which for people who are not familiar with it, is the notion of taking um, a product, whether it's a wine or a spirit um, of different ages. And this is very, very common, for example, in uh, brandy blending. Yeah. So, you know, you look at, um, for example, um, the uh, the Remy Martin yeah. regular green label. It has an eight year old, what they call tasting age. And they get that tasting age as a result of blending a number of different ages. If you look, but if you look at Louis Trez, I mean, there's a little bit, teeny, tiny, teeny, tiny bit in that, which is supposed to be coming from something from Napoleon's cellar. Yeah. So you're looking at something which is a couple of, um, so people are, are, familiar many many chocolate makers are familiar with the concept of aging right but it's basically how long do i need to age a chocolate before i can sell it as opposed to um, any sort of i think sort of formal notion of i am going to do a sensory evaluation of a chocolate over a yeah. period of time and then i'm going to see how it changes for the good or yeah. for the bad yeah. and, and then be both. able to say um <laughs> I can use this and this, and and I'm guessing that different roasts will age differently. Absolutely, absolutely. So one of our nicest uh, aging batches of the barley is one with a particularly low roast. If you keep more acidity in the chocolate mass, it ages better. Mm -hmm. uh, but it also has to do with the type of type of acidity. So if there's tannin in your chocolate, for example, in Indonesian cacao, very often you get this dry mouthfeel if you if you let the chocolate melt, which is uh, which comes from tannin, uh, and that helps the chocolate age also very well. So it's uh, it's uh, a part of roasting, but it's also the type of bean. Our Brazil bean is impossible to age if you keep it untempered in a box yeah. for longer than a week. It will lose its fruitiness. Yeah, uh, it was mentioned before. Not every type of bean uh, allows for aging. Right. So this is something that I would have theorized. So when you look, for example, at the, in the wine world and you were to do uh, something which is early um, you know, examination of the wine um, as it goes into a barrel or very shortly after it has gone into the barrel, you would expect that something with a lot of tannins and a lot of body 
would age extremely differently than, for example, a white wine. Right, which has got relatively low amounts of tannins in it. And you would expect the aging to be very, very different. I don't know how many people are going, okay, not only are we thinking about how the chocolate ages over time, but we're also paying attention to how different roast profiles are going to change aging. And then as you just as you just said, and this is something that I sort of sort of intuited but had never really thought about is that the way chocolate ages in tempered and untempered, right? Right. The general, the consensus was if you take two chocolates and you temper one of them and you don't temper the other, and then you age them the same amount of time, melt them and remelt them, they'd be more or less the same. No, right. True. And your experience is not, is no, not true. Enough. Tempering closes up the chocolate in some way. Yeah. And so it's, uh, if you, t if you temper them, they, uh, they oxidize less quickly. And uh, uh, so, for example, for the, for the Brazil chocolate, because of the fruitiness, that's, it's fragrant fruitiness, which evaporates quickly. We, it, it goes directly straight from the grinder into the tempering machine. And from the tempering machine, um, after the bars are made, they're directly vacuum packed even. So if you vacuum the, the bars, uh, there's less oxygen, uh, and then it will stay fruity. And, uh, and if you have the same batch uh, tempered, it will absolutely uh, uh, develop quicker. Yeah. yeah. So those fruity notes will just dissipate very, will, very quickly. They, some other stuff yeah. can may come in place. It can also be interesting, but it gives a different okay. chocolate. So it's, uh, it's not only about uh, roasting uh, and, and, and age blending, but it's also the technique uh, that you use afterwards. Yeah? So uh, the way you the prepare... Packaging the, <laughs> the packaging technique. The packaging technique, but also... Uh, the what, which kind of machines you use? Uh, not every production type uh, uh, makes it possible to uh, age chocolate, for example. Yeah, I always, if you, you compare wine and chocolate, uh, I like the metaphor of uh, conching versus aging, a bit similar to uh, decanting a wine versus aging it in a bottle. So if you conch the, the chocolate, uh, you make sure there's some oxidization straight after you ground it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what happens actually is just that you get more direct upfront flavors. The fruitiness is much more upfront, whereas if you age the chocolate, you will get a, all the flavor notes will be much more spread out over the whole palate, also in your mouth. Uh, so you get a different effect, and it's similar, I think, if you decant the wine, you bring out upfront more the fruity and direct flavors. But if you age it in the bottle, uh, mm -hmm. you get you get a different development. Uh, usually, it becomes a bit more mellow, a bit softer, right. uh, but also more refined. And then if you, you know, after you take it out of the bottle and decant and let it oxidize, yeah. then you get a, a different, a different flavor experience entirely. Yeah. But if you, if you, so from, if you drink a wine that is basically too young to drink, the normal mm -hmm. solution is to decant it. Uh, so if you have a young Bordeaux yeah. uh, Grand Cru, you decant it because otherwise you, it's, you, it doesn't reveal any flavor notes or at least not, you don't get all the, you don't get uh, enough flavors out of it. And, uh, but there is a difference. So if you would drink it young and decant it, you could compare that to conching, and if you drink it old and you age it in the bottle, then it could be compared to aging the chocolate. I think a similar process happens with the with the different acidity, with the acidity notes, and with the with the, um, the what they call the tertiary aroma, so the, the aromas that are developed during while the while the acidity is broken down. So, so why do you think? I mean, so you know, this is a part of the conversation we started having, but. You have this very, very sophisticated approach to blending, right? And one of the points that you made earlier, which I think is absolutely the case, is that you can do different roast profiles of the same origin, right? And have a much more sophisticated, much more nuanced single origin chocolate. Yeah. Then, and most people will go, I'm going to try to find an optimum place and I'm going to do that. Right? So... What, you know, why do you think, and I don't want to, to think of this as, 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 you know, detracting, right, in any way, your fellow chocolate makers. So why do you think that there is some resistance to this notion of blending? 
Um, well, I think well, it has to, yeah. I have to admit we uh, we developed this in splendid isolation, so we did a new one. <laughs> <out yonder>. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so it started with curiosity, right? So it right. started with curiosity, and uh, that's how we developed it. Splendid so we... isolation. Okay, I like that. <laughs> but uh, there's a, also, I think it's a matter. I think it, it has to do with your uh, tasting preferences as well. For example, I do a lot of tasting with uh, Henk Jan Laas from Cacao Museum in the Netherlands. He lives nearby, and he simply has a different preference than I have. So he likes his chocolate to be very pure, simple, and have like that three or two of main flavor components. That's what he likes in his chocolate. Uh, whereas uh, we recently got a review uh, from Sharon Terenzi, and she wrote about a Dutch blend. It's practically half of the flavor wheel. That's what we like. Yeah. If there's many flavors to discover. So it's, it's, it's also a matter of personal preference. So I don't want to say that searching for the ultimate uh, roasting profile uh, point is not bad, it just delivers a, a different kind of chocolate and we, we feel that the Heine Vera chocolate experience is that mm -hmm. yeah, it, it, we want to eh, touch up on uh, the whole flavor wheel if, if possible. Eh, but it, uh, yeah. right. Well, one of the things that I've noticed, um, I, I think everybody knows about the Parker effect in wine. You know, Robert Parker likes a specific yeah. flavor profile. Yeah, and if yeah, you want yeah. a good rating from Robert Parker, what you do is you make a wine specifically For to him. match his flavor profile. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things that I've noticed, if you look very carefully, for example, at most of the chocolates that win awards, right? What you do is you find a specific approach to making those chocolates. Yeah. So that chocolate makers, for the most part, knowing what the, the grand jury tends to prefer, that you make a chocolate that will, um, that they will like, and you're more likely to be awarded, right? So. Interesting observation, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, you know, my feeling, my feeling about that is, number one, is I refer to it as um, the Hollywood moment. You know, you, you, we all know the movie Sideways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, Paul Giamatti's character goes out into the alley with Thomas Hayden Church's character, and he says, if anybody orders the Merlot, I'm effing leaving, right? Because he, <laughs> he talks about Pinot Noir, the grape, right? The way we talk about Criollos. They're yeah, more yeah. delicate and they bring, you know, it's like, it's really, really quite remarkable. But what happened to the sales of Merlot? I mean, they tanked, right, after that movie. I mean, we don't need that. I mean, we're so early into the whole craft chocolate movement, 22 years yeah. by one dimension, to, to say this is the right way to make chocolate is really, I think it's way too early. We have yet to... Um, come to the level of understanding, certainly from a scientific perspective on what Absolutely. goes on, but, or the experiential. Um, so you guys, um, in your splendid isolation, I mean, I think it's interesting that you started out wanting to make a milk chocolate. I, if I remember correctly from, very, from the first thing you said with the Dutch blend, you wanted to recreate a chocolate that was very, very typically Dutch, but it was a milk chocolate. And the notion of most of these craft chocolate makers starting off with a milk chocolate. I mean, many of them never make milk chocolate. <laughs> uh, it's starting. We see more and more milk uh, coming up. Uh, well, that's true. And, and uh, but the thing with milk. But it's is, obvious that we didn't took the usual route. It's. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing with milk is that uh, somehow the fat in the milk drives out the complexity. And this is why we use, for example, buttermilk because it's it has a very low fat percentage. And even in our Dutch blend, there's a bit of buttermilk to keep the, so to have on the one hand the creaminess and on the other hand, some of the complexity. So we do, we have noticed after making chocolate a couple of years that, uh, that uh, there is a lot of complexity in dark chocolate that we also started to appreciate more and more. So um, mm -hmm. uh, it's not that, uh, actually the first, I think the first year when we were in the market, we only had dark chocolate out there. So um, <laughs> <laughs> we started, so for the, for the consumers, we started off with good dark chocolate. Dark chocolate. Okay. But so we did a lot of experiments with milk chocolate before. Yeah. Yeah. But you just intimated, and this is part of the conversation we have, is that you also blend the kinds of milk that Absolutely. you use. Yeah. So um, these are different fat percentages for the most part? It's a different product. Uh, a different buttermilk product. Is, is, the, is the what's left over if you yeah. uh, if you make the butter. Um, so it has a different chemical composition as well. But uh, one of the main differences, apart from uh, from some other uh, uh, mineralic parts and stuff like that, is uh, is, a, is the fat percentage because that goes into the butter. Right. But there's also my my sense of buttermilk is there's also sort of a, a barnyardy acidity, 
Yeah, the yeah. thing is, it's actually, it's, no, yeah, yeah. That, that's because the, the buttermilk you get in the stores is not real buttermilk. It's, it's milk that is made. It's been soured. Okay. So, so if you drink real buttermilk from freshly made butter, um, mm -hmm. it's, it has a very mellow flavor, uh, but not really acidic. Mm -hmm. No, I can't say it's really acidic. Okay. Right. And we blend it, of course, with uh, whole milk. So, yes, that's uh, the combination. Right. And my understanding, of course, is because this is where you and I first met. Hey, well, so I was at Chocoa and I was walking by the stand and you said Dutch milk is the best milk in the world. <laughs> right. And so we make our Dutch blend with the best milk in the world. And I turned around and said, well, you know, maybe the Swiss might have something to say with that. I couldn't disagree with you either. So they have some <laughs> But well, uh, there is a thing about milk powders that are being used. So we have uh, the first one of the first experiments we did was with, uh, with the milk powder that we had proprietary made for us. And we're going, I'm going to use it also in the future. But it's extremely expensive and small batch. But uh, you can... Most of the milk powders that are produced in a, on a large scale, the industrial scale, um, are heated up to such a high temperature that all the nice flavors of the milk is actually gone. So we have some, done some experiments uh, with a special type of milk from an old Dutch cow race. It's called Blakop. We call it the polar panda. If you see a picture, it looks a bit like a panda bear. And, uh, and it, this is the, the type of cow, the race, that was actually responsible for the Dutch, um, Dutch reputation in cheese and butter. In the 70, from the 17th century on, but now there are only 1,500 of these cows left uh, because they don't produce a lot of milk. Uh, but so we we will we're thinking of bringing up a very specialty bar as well with this special Dutch milk. Sign me up. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready to go. I mean, I have been unapologetic for many many years that when I eat chocolate recreationally as opposed to professionally. Right. I gravitate, I gravitate towards dark milk chocolates. Mm -hmm. you know, I just love the combination of creaminess that's mm -hmm. associated with a milk chocolate with yeah. the flavor intensity that's associated with the dark yeah. chocolate. Mm -hmm. And so I find the dark milks represent yeah. just the, the, the a combination of the two things that I really uh -huh. like. Yeah. Um, better than either a straight milk or a straight dark chocolate. And uh, we just, John Willem just switched off our first experiment with uh, vegan milk mm -hmm. uh, chocolate. Uh, and uh, we're not going to say what's in it, but I can tell you it's also a blend of two different types of vegan milk. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> we're on the other side of an ocean and transportation <laughs> is a little challenge right now, but I would uh, love to, I would love to have an opportunity perfect. to give you feedback on both of those. You know, there's another aspect of blending that, I, that you and I touched on, you know, as I was rushing to get to the airport. Um, we talked to, but you also notice a difference between when you blend in the tempering machine yeah. compared when you when you take nibs yeah. and grind them together. Yeah. And how would you characterize? I mean, do you also find that when you put sugar in, has a really really noticeable effect on what comes out the other side? Or have you experimented with that at all? I have not we, 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 we do uh, on purpose use the crystal sugar, uh, crystal and, and not ground sugar or powdered sugar. Uh, but we haven't really tested uh, with, uh, with uh, the different moments that we put in the sugar. So uh, we, I wouldn't know actually what would be the effect. Mm -hmm. uh, we do know that there's a you get a different flavor out of the chocolate if you use crystal sugar. If you use the ground up sugar, which is powdered sugar, right. uh, it has been, uh, there, there's some decent scientific research in it. If you use uh, powdered sugar and use it uh, during the grinding, you get a reduction of uh, flavor uh, in it. So yes, right. it depends of course on the grain size that yeah. goes in uh, and it has definitely an effect on the, on the, yeah. on the outcome. And for, for blending uh, nibs, uh, uh, let's say, or chocolate mass in the tempering machine or nibs in the grinder, we use different techniques, actually, by and large, what you could, what you could say, I think, is that if, we, if, you, if you would use the nips together, it becomes like a new, a new single origin or a new almost. So there's more interaction between the acidities. So you get a more balanced bar, which is more easy to appreciate. But there's more complexity if you blend it later. But then you need some time to have the different components to settle, let's say. So after tempering, you would need to let the bars rest for at least a month uh, to, to have the different components settle. Um, so, for example, our Dutch blend, we integrate uh, by using the nips uh, from the beginning, let's say, by integrating and grinding it together, simply because you get a more uh, accessible chocolate, and for Dutch blend, is meant also to be accessible for a large audience. Right. But um, 
to be very honest, uh, in the Dutch blend, we, we use a combination. So part of the nips are ground together and part of the chocolate mm -hmm. masses from one origin is, uh, is added later. And I would guess from the way you talked about aging tempered versus aging non-tempered, that when you throw two very, very, throw ch two chocolates together that you know are going to age differently, right? Whether you do that at the nips yeah, or, or no. I'm not sure. It's a bit similar. That's a bit similar to wine, I guess. If you, uh, it depends. If you, if you blend, the, for example, if the, the blending, usually the, in wine, the blending is done before the aging in barrels, because and then what will happen actually is that the tannin of the, of, for example, the Cabernet Sauvignon will help the Merlot also to, uh, to age, and also the tannin in the wood can help to do some extra work. I think if we, if we, uh, if, if if you combine the chocolates and then let them age, uh, the acidity of the one helps the other to age. So I think that's not okay. There, there will be, in any case, the, for example, in, in, uh, if you have a very fragrant acidity in some of the beans, mm -hmm. it will disappear anyway during aging. You can't prevent that. Mm -hmm. This, is, why, why we this is what we would expect aging almost anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, you can't age all the chocolate types, all the cacao types. It's simply that, that is, I think that's that simple. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the thing, all, all the things that we do with the with the bar, with the with the nibs and with the chocolate and uh, all the experiments that we do is simply because of out of curiosity. And if you have a, it's like uh, you were talking about movies. There's one movie that we both like very much. It's about uh, a guy who's uh, who's uh, defending the tobacco industry. Thank and, you for uh, smoking. Uh, thank you for smoking. Ah. <laughs> and uh, there's one scene where uh, he's having an affair with a journalist that screws him up later, uh, and uh, he's having having dinner with her, and he serves her a bottle of Margot, Chateau, Chateau Margot, and she asks him, you know, uh, uh, what makes this, this, this wine so good? And he says, it makes you believe in God. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and this is the moment that we also look for when we make chocolate. You know, so <laughs> so you're, you're looking... The complexity of chocolate. Enough. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, so when I talk about chocolate, right, um, and I talk about rating and reviewing chocolate, I've moved away from an intellectual approach which is on a scale of one to 10, let's think about texture. On a scale of one to 10, let's think about flavor. On a yeah. scale of one to, you know, snap and all that kind of yeah. stuff, forget it, right? <laughs> uh, what I wanna do is I wanna put a piece of chocolate in my mouth and what I want is an oh my God moment. You just put it in your mouth and it's like all of your senses contract. I mean, the world all of a sudden becomes focused, right? On what is happening in your mouth and everything else sort of disappears. I mean, it, this is what I'm looking for in chocolate. It's one of the reasons why I like um, judging, judging bonbons, mm -hmm. right? And flavored white chocolates. You know, white chocolate for most people um, is a delivery via medium for other flavors because the white chocolate itself is often not very interesting, mm -hmm. right? But there's a lot of creativity that goes into it. You put it in your mouth and all of a sudden, mm -hmm. amazing. It's composition. Yeah. Right. And the same thing I think is true of bonbons. Now you put it in your mouth and it is in fact a gestalt moment, yeah. right? Rather than sort of a deconstruction and reconstruction moment, it's really all about the zeitgeist. I mean, that's yeah. what's going on in, in your mouth and going about and doing that. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, further explorations you might have and in finding that um, the chocolate that makes you see God. Oh, we have another million ideas that we want to test. So uh, time is our. No <laughs> time is always the problem. There's uh, always the biggest problem. Yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, and and to be honest, also with the roasting, uh, uh, I think we're, we're just on the let's say on the beginning of understanding what's happening during roasting. Uh, mm -hmm. We would both prefer to have a lot more information about the exact. Uh, uh, exact chemical processes in the bean during roasting and mm -hmm. there's a lot more to discover so uh, the way we currently work is rather intuitive actually uh, we, mm -hmm. we test the beans we taste them we try and experiment uh, it's really like trial and error uh, we now sort of start we're just starting to discover some of the patterns in roasting and we expanded it to one other bean but we don't know if it so it may it may hold for two two types of origins but not for a third one we don't know so it's really an exploration still yeah Okay. And, but you, but again, from one of our more recent conversations, what you're also planning to do to help you understand that is to start instrumenting your roasters more heavily. Yeah. So right now you're aware of the temperature that the roaster thinks it's at, but yeah. that temperature may be different from the way the temperature changes in the mass of beans itself. 
Absolutely. So one of the, uh, we're actually in coffee, this is quite normal. So one of our customers who sells our chocolate is a coffee roaster in the Netherlands. He's one of our favorite coffee roasters, actually. And he told him, yeah, he, he has, a, for example, he uses a specific software and, a, and, a, and a sensor that goes into the drum. So we're gonna, we're absolutely gonna source that one as well. So we know exactly the temperature in the drum. Yeah. So now I, we can only guess. But so also on the level where the beans are. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, right, we yeah. have there's in the oven, but then exactly but in, in the yeah. drum between the beans. Yeah, and you know exactly. Beans, yeah. no, always, absolutely. We always measure skin temperature of the bean uh, when it comes, it goes in, and when it comes out. Um, okay. We test new roast profiles. We tend to take out the beans or a few beans and just to, t to see what the temperature is out. So we have some kind of clue of the temperature okay. development. Um, well, you are talking. You are talking about the physics of heat transfer here. Yeah. yeah and so, a very, very hot, very, very short roast, the temperature might not penetrate to the center of the bean. Could be. And so, it may not be fully may not be fully roasted. Absolutely. Whereas you target something which is low and long, you're actually yeah. changing the way the heat gets transferred into yeah. the bean. And also, the oven changes that way. So, for example, if you use a convection oven, uh, which is very often used by chocolate makers. Uh, uh, there's always the air. If you if you if you turn it on 130 degrees, the air that will be blown in blown in the in the oven over the beans will also be 130. The skin of the bean will reach 130 quite quickly. Uh, whereas in our drum oven, we place it on 130. There's some kind of indirect heating effect because within the drum, mm -hmm. the beans also will keep their temperature, the mass of the beans. So it depends on the amount of beans that you put in the oven, etc. But also the type of oven. We see a lot of differences between different type of roasters. Right. One of the things I noticed, um, I had a chance to go visit uh, Francois Prelu many, many years ago, uh, where I was doing a project for a colleague, and we asked Francois to do a, a special chocolate run. And we went, were in his factory overseeing the roasting. Right? And what was really, really uh, surprising to me was just how heavily um, the mass of cocoa beans um, influence the temperature of the roaster. Yeah, I mean, you could have something which is up at 350 Fahrenheit. I don't know what the number was, right? Mm -hmm. But you drop the beans in, and you'd you'd quench that by 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. And how long it took back? How long it took yeah, for the uh, roaster uh, to return? Yeah, if you have the physical uh, formula for uh, for um, heat exchange, mass of the the mass of the entity is uh, is is a very important multiplicator. So uh, well, yeah, not only that, but the temperature of the beans. Another thing that I noticed. Yeah, I yeah, sure. The with, I, yeah. I was working with a client in Canada in the middle of winter, and we pulled the beans out of storage, um, and they were one temperature. But we left a mass of beans that we had cleaned on a stainless steel table that was sitting on the concrete floor, and they were twenty degrees colder yeah, yeah, than yeah. beans that were somewhere else. And if you throw those beans into the roaster, they're very different. But he yeah. was a very, very technical roaster. Yeah. And he had purchased a roaster um, from um, a Kicking Horse Coffee, a big roaster in Canada. Okay. And it was heavily instrumented. And he could control the temperature remotely and programmatically. So he was able to use the software. I think it's called Artisan, which is a very, very common open source coffee roasting software. So that what he could do is he could change the temperature of the roaster to make sure that it followed a specific curve. Right, curve Once yeah. he identified what that curve was, nice. he was nice. able to have the roaster Mimic. turn the temperature yeah. up and down in order to be able to follow mm -hmm. that curve going forward. Yeah, nice, yeah. nice, nice. It's uh, very common, in, of course, in the, in in the coffee. The coffee roasting. is way ahead of, yeah. of cacao, I think, in that respect. Yeah. Yeah. And also, what uh, we our, our roaster uh, has a max capacity of 50 kilos, but we never use those big batches. But even if we use the same profile for 12 kilos or 20 kilos, you get a completely different result. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And of course, we also you measure the temperatures before they go in. It, it needs to be your room temperature. So all the things, our steps are measured. Uh, yes. Right. And you keep a detailed log of everything so you can refer to it and going, oh, this is what the parameters were when I threw yeah. it in. Yeah. Have, you found, have you found how much um, does ambient temperature and ambient humidity affect roast? I mean, do you notice a difference? When it's a wet or rainy day as opposed to it's a sunny day? Uh, and rain here is rather constant inside, I think. But the beans, <laughs> so yes, it's simply the, that it's not that we, the, the humidity in the, in the building is, there, there can be some, it can be between like 55 and 65 degrees Celsius, okay. uh, um, percentage uh, relative humidity. Um, but what, it's quite stable here. It's in relatively Netherlands, stable. I have to admit. Yeah, but uh, I think uh, the, the, the humidity of the bean is really a uh, big difference because uh, 
it also adopts the temperature differently because it starts evaporating during the heating process and then it loses heat. Uh, for example, what I was telling, if you import beans, sometimes uh, it's preserved during transport uh, not very well or less dried uh, mm -hmm. with, the, with the farmer. And that very much affects the, uh, the end results uh, of making mm -hmm. chocolate. If you're going, for example, if your cacao is more moist, even though you roast it, not all the, the moist content is still not the same. And if you have a relatively wet bean, and then you're going to grind it, for example, a classic uh, stone grinder, you will see that the temperature of during the grinding will go up. Uh, because it has and more that, uh, heavy work. And that affects yeah. the flavor as well. So for these kind of things, you also have to uh, compensate. Or if you want to bend all those factors out, you have to dry your cacao for quite some time. I just want to show you, this is uh, beans from Bali that we import ourselves. I'm not sure if you can see it, but there's the humidity controllers inside the bag. So these okay. are, uh, are have well controlled humidity. Uh, but that's the exception of the rule, I'd say. <laughs> yeah, we, for the Bali cacao, we ask them to make a special selection for us, but also put in uh, uh, dehydrating uh, pocketed so that it will be perfectly preserved during the trip. So that's where we can guarantee it's uh, good here. But this is very constant, and you can always apply the same profiles. Well, one of the one of the disagreements I have um, with people who make what they think of as raw chocolate. And the the approach to roasting is they say at no point should the the any should the cocoa beans ever be exposed to any temperature above forty eight point seven degrees centigrade. If to admit, Clay, I don't know what raw well, chocolate is. Well, but what I want to say is so many well, different definitions by now. I don't know. So, uh, <laughs> well, not talking about that. I mean, so there are different definitions. Whether it's one hundred and four Fahrenheit, one hundred and ten Fahrenheit, or one hundred and eighteen Fahrenheit, that's not really right. the point that I was trying to make. Sorry. <laughs> um, it's again because they have a lack of understanding of the physics of heat transfer, right? Mm -hmm. So I can put a cocoa bean to a new an oven that's 100 degrees centigrade, and if it's you know for the first few minutes anyway, um, it's evaporative cooling. Yeah, right. Really. So I'm just taking moisture sure. out of it. And so what is in yeah. fact the surface temperature of the bean, and how quickly does that heat take to go through the the husk? And even if I were to take the outer three microns of the bean and get it to 119 degrees Fahrenheit, does that kill the bean? And the answer is absolutely not. Absolutely not. But again, it's, it's another one of these variables that I think that a lot of people don't control for, because I know about controlling temperature. But if I've got a bean and I'm throwing it in there at 6% humidity and another bean that I'm throwing in there at 8% humidity, Right, what I have is a different profile in terms of evaporative cooling. Absolutely. And that evaporative cooling effect is going to change the way the heat is going to be transferred into the bean. I'm also always curious when uh, makers of raw chocolate, if they measure the temperature during the grinding, because if they hardly roast their beans, I'm quite certain that the, the temperature during uh, in the stone grinder <clears throat> will be a lot higher. Uh, higher than 45, higher than 50 degrees, higher right. than 55 right. degrees, probably approximately 70. Right. And, right. and what you need to mention... If it is quite high, then you get a, a very, very high uh, uptake yeah. in temperature. Right. Yeah. Well, one of the things that we know is if the temperature of the mass rises, and I have to worry about keeping the temperature of the mass below whatever the temperature I'm looking for in terms of maximum yeah. temperature, that at some point, right, the temperature is above that temperature. And to the best of my knowledge, nobody has ever measured the instantaneous temperature under the grinding surface. Right? Well, I think that the cut figure, our, our, uh, our Euro grinder has a. No, under, 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 under the grinding Yeah, yeah, because no, yeah, yeah, we, we, you know, our Euro grinder has a temperature sensor in the mass, so it measures. No, I want, I, want it, I want it in the stone. In the, ah, stone, in the stone, he mentioned. So that I understand what the instantaneous ah, yeah, temperature is yeah, yeah, and yeah, how yeah. that changes. Ah, right. With respect yeah. to pressure, yeah, sure. Because yeah. I mean, we don't know either. Right, yeah. intuitively, intuitively, but it's, but in actual, practically, nobody knows. No, you're absolutely right. right. Also and so I think it's an interesting place. And I don't know how you instrument a stone so that it doesn't become vulnerable to cracking. Absolutely. I mean, you could put a hole in it and then put a temperature sensor in it. Yeah, but you right? never know and the surface temperature then. I'm sorry. The exact, then you will never know the exact temperature at the surface when, just at the moment when, when when it hits the it hits the the surface, uh, it's difficult. But I it's but I, I might have a uh, anyway. It's 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 
it's but, not uh, important. Okay. It's not important for the purposes of this conversation, um, <laughs> really. But it really does talk about there are so many variables Absolutely. Um, that um, we don't know anything about. I mean, and we know about them in terms of the difference between conical burr grinders and other kinds of grinders in coffee. We yeah. know how time and temperature and gap and all that thing affect. Right. What is it we're looking for? And we know that people are looking for, you know, I'm looking for, you know, 50, 17 gram of dose of coffee with 300 grams of water is going to give me with a 30 second shot, you know, this level yeah. of total dissolved solids in the coffee. I mean, we understand yeah. all of that. Right. And we don't have any of that knowledge. Um, uh, codified. Fun, eh? We think it, there is a lot of room for experiments and exploration in the cocoa industry, so that's nice. And most of the differences between the chocolate that we taste from craft chocolate makers, uh, many, many of, the, of the chocolate makers use, for example, a cocoa town grinder. Uh, so basically the difference of their chocolate is uh, the type of oven they use or the heat they use, uh, the way they roast and the type of oven and how long they use the cocoa, how long they put the, the mass into the cocoa town. That's about the three variables, and you can get, but still with these three, you can get an infinite number of different right. chocolates. Right. And this is before we talk into talk about all the other things to get done. One of which is your personal philosophy about what kind of chocolate you want to make. And so I want to I want to really thank both of you today. So we're at about thirty minutes, so maybe a little over. Um, so I want to thank you both for uh, being uh, willing to sit and talk with me today about these things um, and to be sharing um, your. Of not only your philosophy, but what it is that you've learned uh, in the process of doing this for the last couple of years. I am like completely and totally excited to learn more about what your experience uh, experiments teach you, not only in terms of the chocolate that you're making, but in understanding more about how your deeper understanding of the variables starts to drive the approaches that you're working for and how your understanding about aging and other things like this also affect, you know, how it is you do things like blending and at what point you blend and how do you control for these things? I think it's a, uh, from the moment I met you guys in Choco in Amsterdam, um, I have been huge fans of this because this is something that I have been talking about um, for close to 10 years that the notion of, you know, um, there is one roast profile and we're going to get to that roast profile completely experientially. And we're, we're not going to know anything about the time and temperature curve about what's going on. And we don't know anything about what's going on in the grinder, which is, there's nothing. It's entirely. And I think that that is the fundamental difference between craft chocolate and industrial chocolate. I mean, there's art and science and it's a continuum. And at the industrial end, what you do is all the art comes up front in terms of deciding what it is that we want to do. And we use our understanding to program the machines so that instead of making 35 kilos at a time, we can make a thousand kilos an hour. Yeah. Right. But they're still the same sort of art. And one of the things that happens in craft chocolate is that art happens a la minute in the moment yeah. for every single batch. We're yeah. making these decisions in the moment. Right. And they're fundamentally creative decisions based on, right our aesthetic understanding, what it is that we're trying to do as chocolate based makers. On, based on the smell and taste of what you're doing. So right. Always yeah. a constant evaluation. But if anyone, uh, uh, let's say, if there's anyone uh, who's uh, watching this video who's doubting uh, that uh, different roast profiles uh, can lead to very different results on the same bean, uh, he's kindly invited to come over and uh, have a smell and taste of our three different profiles of the Brazil bean. <laughs> Well, and, and having visited the factory and tasted all of the chocolates, this is something that I can completely recommend. If you are ever in Rotterdam, um, make a point of giving these guys a call, going in and seeing what it is they're doing. Now, you're generally available all over Europe, so people can email you, and or they can go to your website, they can buy it places. I know you guys are not yet available in the United States. You know, I have to... I have to... Oh, I'm sorry? Almost. Oh, good. Well, please let me know because I want to let people know. But right now, I have to reply upon the I have to rely upon the kindness of strangers. Right? But to be very honest, uh, within, within Europe also, we are just starting to have some uh, some customers because we we actually launched our brand only last year, January. So we were we were just one year on the market in the Netherlands. Okay. But we're working already with chocolate for a couple of years. So uh, before that, we did a lot of experimenting uh, for many years, and then only one and a half year we launched uh, our brand. So. Yeah. 
So it's still a work in progress uh, and we hope to expand, but we get a lot of uh, stores that are interested in our chocolate. So we're going to expand it to the rest of Europe and the world, actually. Yes. And so hopefully, I, I, hopefully it's always a work in progress. Yeah. That there's always some new creative expression that you're looking for, some new avenue, some new thing that you're looking to do. Because for me, I find out that's what keeps it new and interesting, and exciting. But if there's always some new creative challenge or new something I want to do, I get really excited about um, waking up in the morning and, and getting through the day. Well, Clay, it was a very pleasure to talking to you again, and we hope we can have another discussion in the future. Of course, so I'm, I am factory looking factory forward. Them, no, I'm looking forward to it. I, I and I hope that uh, we get enough, you know, positive feedback from this video. That what we can do is um, schedule another one um, in a couple of months, perhaps, and That's see what some of your new things are. You guys know I'm a huge fan and want to do everything I can to make sure um, that people know about what it is um, that you guys are doing. And I think that the the example that you're setting in terms of your approach to blending, the creativity um, that, you're, that you're showing towards roasting, uh, which is an intellectual curiosity, not just an experiential curi curiosity. Yeah. Um, and being able to take the art and an understanding of science and mush them together in a way that guides the development of things, I think is um, a sign of where the next generation of craft chocolate makers needs to go in order to be able to expand access to new markets and continue to grow the number of people who want to buy the chocolate, right? Not just the number of people who are making the chocolate. Yeah. And I think that's a really, really important thing to go. So thank you very much. I'm gonna let you guys get back to work. I know you've got grinders to turn on and other things like that because you turned them on for this. And brush to pour, yeah, the tempering uh, machine yeah. is running, but uh, the ball, <laughs> ball will uh, we'll make sure you get one. Yeah. It's, been, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you guys uh, very, you. very much.